represent our entire community. This includes every single student that is in our building, which as of today consists of approximately 5,675 students, every one of our 816 staff members, and our entire 35,276 community members, whether they have children in our district or not. We use our mission and vision to guide us. So to start tonight's meeting, um, I'd like to, to review our mission and vision as a district. Our mission is to cultivate a culture of academic excellence through inclusive and innovative learning opportunities for the whole child. And our vision to, is to empower all learners to reach their full potential in a globally competitive world. Um, tonight, we're honored to um, recognize our outstanding retirees who have really lived by our mission and vision for many, many years, uh, supporting our, our children within the district. So thank you. Um, to begin, I'd need a motion for the approval of the agenda, which includes superintendent's agenda items 12 and 13 and personnel consent agenda 3D. So moved. Second. Mrs. Weber. Mr. Cunniper. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. And Dr. Steger. Aye. The agenda is approved. I need a motion for the approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Any comments, questions, or corrections from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. And just to clarify, the second was Mrs. Bitter. Thank you. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. And Mr. Ballant? Aye. The minutes are approved. Mrs. Weber, would you uh, please give us a overview of the meeting protocol? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Ballant. And welcome to all of you here tonight. You are probably some of our most special guests of the year, and we welcome you this evening. Um, for those of you who are joining us in our virtual audience this evening, the agenda for tonight's meeting is available on our Board of Edu Education website. Um, the minutes that have just been approved will be posted on the Board of Education website as well. For those of you who have public participation requests, please send those to tonight's moderator, Bill Fritz at fritzw at sycamoreschools.org. Um, and he will get those to the board when we get to the public participation um, section of our agenda. But first this evening, we are very excited to start it out with our recognition of our special guests. Mr. Lewis, I will hand the meeting over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ballant, members of the board. I completely agree that this is, um, this is always one of the most um, celebrated, exciting, nights of our school year. Um, I would say graduation is the other one that we all uh, look forward to. But tonight we're here to celebrate uh, the achievements, the success, the careers of a number of individuals uh, on our team. And uh, as much as we're sad to lose them and see them go, we know they're headed off for new, new adventures, new exciting careers, potentially uh, just things that they want to do now. They get to make that decision. So uh, I know our students and our staff and the people that they leave behind from a standpoint of mentorship and guardi uh, guidance and just, you know, many of them serving as parents and parental roles and, you know, doing things that's what's best for kids. Um, it will be hard to watch them go, but we're excited for uh, what lies ahead for them. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to invite some special guests up to assist me today. Uh, Mrs. Scrace, our SEA president, will join me, and Mrs. Friel, who is our OPSI president, will join me. And then Mrs. Wegner is going to uh, assist as well. So uh, for our retirees, uh, I'm going to call you up uh, one at a time. It would be great uh, as we uh, call and talk about you. You come and stand up here by us, and then obviously uh, head down the line for Mrs. Wegner, uh, get your wonderful gift. And then I'm going to ask you to stay up here because we want to celebrate all of you together. We want to get a picture of all of you together. We want to give your families a chance to take pictures of you. So, you know, board, we'll have to pause our important meeting. I know that you'll be upset about that, but we want to make sure we give the proper time to these uh, wonderful retirees. So <clears throat> without further ado, uh, we are going to start with Kim Bryant, our intervention specialist at junior high. So a little information about Kim. Kim has always worked at the junior high as a special education teacher. Uh, she originally began working with students with behavioral concerns, then students who were twice exceptional, and finished as a class uh, categorical generalist. 
Uh, Kim plans to travel in her camper and spend time with friends and family. Kim also just accepted a position with the Grand Canyon Conservancy and will be starting at the Grand Canyon Desert View Watchtower in July. Adventure. <laughs> Next is Martha Deniman, Secretary at E.H. Green. So Martha has been the exempt secretary since the 1998-99 school year. She plans on spending more time with family, especially grandchildren. Good plan, Martha, good plan. Um, <clears throat> Martha is also planning to visit family and friends in Texas and New York. She hopes to reconnect with many already retired friends. She is excited to start a new chapter in the book of life. Um, Martha, having some retirees in my family, they say that every day is Saturday. So enjoy that. <laughs> Next, Kevin Donovan, bus driver, transportation. Kevin has been a special needs Lyft driver for the past 10 and a half years. He has built great relationships with his students and family. I got to pers personally witness this in uh, my first year in the district as I rode the route uh, with Kevin, and I can attest to the fact that your families love you so much that he told me a story right before we got up here that Mr. Miller called him into his office and said, you're going to have to speed it up and stop talking so much to families because they're giving him coffee and gifts as he goes along the way. So after retirement, Kevin plans on traveling with his beautiful wife, Pam. Pam, thank you for taking him off our hands. Uh, he will also play his guitar, manage a men's softball and soccer teams, and do some gardening and reading. So I'm glad you get to relax, Kevin. <laughs> Next, uh, Vicki Essler, teacher at Blue Ash Elementary. Vicki has worked 40 years at Sycamore. And Vicki, I find that impossible when you're only 50, 40 years old, right? I don't know how that happens. 39 at Blue Ash in three different buildings. So there's, there's an accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, she was a second grade teacher in the last 32 years as a kindergarten teacher. She has had the privilege of working with seven superintendents, eight principals, 12 assistant principals, hundreds of colleagues, and thousands of students and family. Vicki has impacted so many with her mentorship and guidance. Vicki plans are to travel, play with grandkids, and do more volunteer work. That's awesome. Next, Linda Furlong, fourth grade language arts teacher, Montgomery Elementary. <laughs> Linda has worked at Montgomery Elementary for 25 years almost all at fourth grade with the same team. After 25 years, Linda is finally graduating from fourth grade. <laughs> We're excited for you. Linda leaves a legacy of strong relationships with kids and family, doing what is best for each student. She plans to travel, do yoga, spend time with family and friends. And Linda, I know uh, just hearing from your colleagues how much they're going to miss your guidance and mentorship in fourth grade. So. You've left behind a great legacy, and it'll be their job in fourth grade to carry that legacy on. So oh, thank you. It. Next, Anita Harris, educational assistant, E.H. Green.
Anita subbed for one year in the district before being hired full time. Uh, she has worked at the junior high and obviously now spent time at EH Green, but before that, Bobby B. Fairfax. And uh, Anita, one thing I know about you is we appreciate your dedication to all students and working with all students and helping them be successful. She plans on spending more time, <clears throat> excuse me, with family and traveling. So congratulations. Next, Amy Johnson, teacher, Mapledale Elementary School. Amy began working for Sycamore in 2000 as a substitute teacher returning to full-time teaching in 2002. Her entire Ohio teaching career has been at Mapledale. I find that often to be what happens here at Mapledale. A lot, a lot of people don't graduate from Mapledale, Amy. <clears throat> and three of your children went to Mapledale, yes. so that's awesome as well. What a family experience at Mapledale. She has taught grades two, three, and four with 17 years in grade two. Uh, Amy plans to visit her grandson. That's great. She also plans on gardening, scrapbooking, and enjoying time with family and friends. Congratulations, Amy. Connie Merrill, Child Nutrition, Junior High. Connie started working for our Child Nutrition Department in 1996 at Blue Ash Elementary. She then moved to E.H. Green in 1998 and then to the junior high in 1999 finishing up her 26 years at the junior high. <clears throat> she has also been a bus monitor since 2017. And thank you for that, because that is a difficult position. Uh, Connie plans on traveling, reading, crafting, and redoing her house and yards since she recently moved. That doesn't sound like relaxing in retirement there, <laughs> Connie. <I> get done. <laughs> but we want you to enjoy that new house. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's another unique experience when you get to um, recognize a husband and a wife all at the same time. So Terry Merrill, custodian Montgomery Elementary. <laughs> Terry started as a custodian at EH Green, the bus compound and also the board office. He then went to work at the junior high, then moved to Montgomery Elementary. Uh, Terry plans on enjoying life and traveling. Terry, I hate to tell you, you're going to be working on a new house from what I hear. I know. I know. <laughs> so I don't think you're going to get to re relax or rest too much. But And I've already told Connie, if he drives her too crazy, she can send him back and we can use him. So thank you, Terry. Thank you. Chris Pappas, special education teacher, Mapledale Elementary. Chris came to Sycamore to teach junior high special education classes and was able to join a cohort group there to earn her master's degree with a reading endorsement. Next, she was welcomed to join the special education team at Mapledale. It's been a joy uh, watching her teach students and working with her peers over all these years, um, transitioning from the old Mapledale building to the new one. Uh, Sycamore gave so many opportunities to serve on committees, literacy council, special education council, third and fourth grade curriculum committees, <clears throat> excuse me, master teacher. I was an overachiever. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, but that's okay. That's what we need, right? If you're gonna leave a lasting legacy. We gotta have somebody else to step up and pick up those things. Um, and never forget the SLO committee. I think your colleagues would say, let's forget that the SLO the committee. Worst committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing no one else shares that sentiment. So Chris plans on slowing down and taking it easy. Now I'm reading the next sentence ahead of this. You're not gonna slow down and you're not taking That's it right. easy. 
She plans on going scuba diving, zip lining, parachuting from planes, sailing, traveling, being with grandchildren, and building a new home in Greece while cherishing the years she spent with students and colleagues at Sycamore. And Chris, I can say we are going to cherish you um, the same. So thank you. Lynn Stubblebein, art teacher, junior high. Lynn has worked 23 years as an art teacher at Sycamore Junior High and for a handful of years for both Sycamore Junior High and high school. Uh, Lynn plans on spending time with her growing family, traveling, working on her own art and volunteering. Lynn, any special art projects in the future? Anything you're thinking about? Just finish the ones I started right okay. now. <laughs> yep. Hey, some, now you have time to actually finish art projects, right? So Lynn, we thank you for uh, not only dedication to students, but dedication to art education at Sycamore Junior High. Thank you. Sandra Torp, French teacher, junior high. I'm sorry, I said Sandra Saunders. That's, That's okay. just too many names, too many letters right here in the middle, but I apologize. Sandra has worked at the junior high for 17 years, mentored teachers, um, been a member of the Sycamore Advisory Committee. So that's awesome. Uh, Sandra plans on traveling, spending time with family, seeing friends, sewing and knitting. How do you say retirement in French? Le, uh, le retraite. Put you right on the spot, didn't I? Well, Sandra, congratulations. And again, thank you for, you know, your dedication to students and especially with global language. So thank you. And so uh, to wrap up, we also have some individuals that were unable to be here. So uh, I'll just read their names really quickly and their positions so that you know, we want we we certainly value them, and again, we're um, excited for their next chapter, but also sad to see them go. Uh, Ken Clark, teacher, Sycamore High School; Melissa Houston, teacher, Sims Elementary; Melanie Howard, teacher, Mapledale Elementary; Laura Leonard, bus driver, transportation; Randy Lothrop, teacher, high school; uh, Susan Lutmer, educational assistant, Sims Elementary; Brian Osborne, psychologist, Sims and Montgomery Elementary. Diane Rasnick, Educational Assistant, Sims Elementary. Barb Simon, Educational Assistant, Blue Ash Elementary. David Stump, Custodian, Mapledale Elementary. Brenda Wisman, Educational Assistant, at E.H. Green. And then Cindy Zetterberg, Teacher, Sycamore High School. Again, let's give these uh, wonderful retirees a round of applause. And school board members, I would love it if you would come around and, and shake the hands of our retirees and thank them for their work. And then if you all could stay and get a picture together, we would love that. Uh, families and feel free to come up and get some pictures.
Does anyone else need a picture before we release them? And I am certain that you probably want to stay for the whole board meeting. I know how exciting that is, but we will completely understand if you do not stay. So congratulations. I gotta help them. I gotta help them to the park. Help them. I'll be right back. Mr. I, I will jump and ship.
Okay. Um, always a great time and celebration to honor the uh, amazing achievements of our retirees in the district. Um, as we move on with the uh, regular portion of our agenda, um, I have one public participation. Mrs. Weber, is there any other public participation? Mr. Fritz? I have not received any. Mr. Fritz. Only Mrs. Dippold. Okay. Mrs. Dippold? Hello again. I spoke at a meeting here three months ago regarding my concern about the lack of transparency. Your written minutes from that meeting say, Carrie Dippold addressed the board on the issue of transparency. She noted that several items on the agenda reference informational materials. She asked how members of the public can access these materials. She also asked how members of the public can be notified of special meetings. These written minutes are misleading. It sounds like I'm simply asking for information that I didn't know where to find. That sounds nice, but you know that that's not what I was asking or conveying. I was asking why you were hiding this information. If you listened to the meeting as opposed to reading the misrepresented minutes, I posed questions about why information that is part of the public agenda is hidden in a packet. Why are those packets not posted? In addition to the examples that I gave then, I can show several more, including today's agenda. There are several items that you're voting on today that say their information is included in a packet. So nobody here can see what that is. It's been three months since, but the board has not provided any response to why these informational packets are not being provided, nor how or when special meeting notifications are made or why they are not made. I'm well aware that the public has a legal right to make a public records request to get any information. I was never asking how one could get the information. You board members know that I know this because I had to involve you in the past after months of being ignored, even with constant follow-up. I finally received some of the requested information after asking for your help. However, I'm now finding that some information was still withheld. I'm still waiting on answers as to why some of it was withheld over six months ago, but my questions are not being answered. Instead, I'm now being asked for clarification. No one asked for clarification back when I requested initially. They just ignored the parts that were not provided. Only now that I'm showing failure to provide, you'd like clarification. Board policy and Ohio revised code state that the district legally needs to provide requested records in a reasonable amount of time. I know of several others who have also requested information that is not related to any of my records requests. All have had the same experience as me, being ignored and waiting three plus months to hear a response, if hearing anything at all. That's a, not a reasonable amount of time. If one has to request the information and jump through hoops or prove that it's been withheld to get it, then you're not being transparent. You are being deceitful. You are purposely hiding information, which makes us wonder what is there to hide? I'm guessing you board members get all of the information in these packets for public meetings without requesting it. The public has just as much right to all the information that you get for the public portion of these meetings. It is no more difficult to attach these packets than it is to attach the meeting minutes and agendas. Waiting three plus months is not timely or acceptable for some of this information. In my records requests and discussion with administration and board, I am finding too many things that are being hidden. You, the board and administration are aware of these things and are assuring me that you're making changes to prevent some of the past unacceptable behaviors that, this, that have been uncovered. Your policies also state that we cannot discuss personal issues at these public forums, so I cannot give all those details in the meeting. I'm abiding by your policies and Ohio law. You should ensure that everyone is. I would prefer not to stand up here and ask, have to ask these questions. However, I'm still waiting on responses to questions that I've sent to you as a board, not public record requests, information that I've asked over two months ago. So what should one do when they are ignored by the board? Thank you, Mrs. Dippel. Moving forward onto the superintendent's agenda, I need a motion for the approval of the school calendar. So moved. Second. Just a couple of things to note, Mr. Ballant and members of the board. Uh, it's the third reading of the school calendar. And just to refresh our memories, we did a multiple readings and we spaced them out over evening meetings because we felt it was important you know, for our community to get time to digest the information. We certainly wanted to digest the information and we wanted to give time for, I would say better information to be available to us because of our construction projects. So 
Uh, no major changes from the last reading to this reading. We had a few minor adjustments, but I do want to thank um, our representatives from SEA, uh, OPSI, our teaching staff, our administrative staff, in our district flight team. Everyone had input into this calendar. We collaborated with numerous people. We also got great feedback from parents um, in some of our um, work groups that we work with, some of our advisory groups. These calendars are not easy and we certainly can't make uh, something happen for all. You know, everyone has an opinion on it, but I think this calendar represents a very collaborative effort uh, among all those groups that I mentioned. And, and I feel, uh, proud to say that uh, that process worked and a huge thank you to Mrs. Wagner and her staff because they worked through all of those meetings, all those additional uh, feedback sessions and uh, what we're presenting to you today is, is ready for approval. So thank you. Uh, can I ask a, just a quick question? I'm trying to look at the colors on this, but do you know, Mrs. Wagner, how many professional learning days we have on the calendar? For 2324, mm -hmm. we have um, three at the start, 21, 22, 23. Mm -hmm. And then we've got one in um, September. If you recall, we had two at the end of the year. And then we got feedback that that was not working. So we split those up. So we have one in um, September. And then we have one in April. So we split those. Um, so those are the professional learning days. And then also in November, those are similar to the collaboration days that we had with staff um, this past November on 21, on, on um, 20 and 21 in November. So those three, four, five, six, seven. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just like to thank our administration and staff for working on this calendar and putting it together. I mean, if, if you know, if we take a step back, construction has dramatically impacted our calendar for the last three years. Um, and there has been a slight decrease in the number of overall instructional days on the calendar. But what we heard loud and clear during the master facility planning process is that our community did not want kids in trailers. They did not want kids in gyms where they're having classes. So um, if you look at the total picture of what we've done from a, from a building standpoint, with the minimal impacts that we've had on the calendar, uh, I think we've done a phenomenal job. And then obviously as we move forward and construction is no longer an issue, you know, we'll see that those instructional days do go uh, back up. So thank you very much. Mr. Bellin, I think it's a great point to point out the personal learning days that are in the calendar will kind of sunset after the 23-24 calendar. Those, those will go back to in-person learning days for students. And we're excited about that. We, we obviously are, all of our staff want to be in person with their students um, and not providing some you know, opportunity to do it virtually. But I think we felt strongly if we have to squish the calendar, let's make sure that there's an instructional uh, component to that. So appreciate the guidance of the board on that and giving us some latitude to get through these couple of rough years with the calendar. So excited to get back to normal with new buildings. Any additional questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Motion passes. I do have one quick question about the calendar, not this calendar, but when will we get our calendars in the mail again? Will we ever have those again? <laughs> Mr. Lewis? We, you know, we the will paper not, ones that the we, print calendars. Yeah, do we, will we do those any longer? We do not do those any longer. They were just extremely cost prohibitive to uh, what we were trying to do. And honestly, Mrs. Bitter, from the minute we printed them, there were already changes to them and people did like them, but I think the relevance of them were as much as people liked them and they were very colorful and they had great pictures. They just weren't very relevant once we printed them because things change as you all know, moment to moment. So uh, appreciate the question though. With that, Mr. Lovell, Master Facility Planning Update with some exciting pictures of a progress on our new buildings. So thank you. And Mr. Ballant, Mr. Lovell is just gonna stay up here for a, a number of items. <laughs> Sorry, right. exciting times. Well, Mr. President, members of the board, thanks for having me. I always, like I've always said, I enjoy coming up here. And in fact, 
as I was sitting right back here looking at um, honoring all of our retirees, I can't, I couldn't help but just make the connection between the work that we're doing to create these facilities. And the reason we're doing that is because we want these environments that just um, create exceptional opportunities for teaching and learning. And so giving our teachers the tools that they need to educate our students in the future, now and in the future. And so um, just kind of anchoring in on that as we go through some of these projects. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but again, I just like to kind of put this in front of you all in our community, just to highlight the work that's happening across the district. But specifically, um, I do want to focus on um, EH Green today. And obviously, um, each meeting I come up, I try to hit some hype highlights of EH Green because that is our project that's going to be um, coming to a close here sooner than later. And so uh, we continue to be uh, we continue to be on time with this project. We continue to look for a temporary occupancy July 1st. Um, I always use caution, especially with our staff listening, just because we have temporary occupancy doesn't mean that we're able to get into the building, but it gives allows us the opportunity to kind of do some of those finishing touches. I do want to, though, highlight the fact that um, we have some exciting things happening that are really making this environment look finished. We've got finished painting that's going on, the ceiling pad installations going up. So when you walk into the environment, it actually looks like a classroom. The other thing that I want to note up here is the second half of May, we're going to be bringing the boilers over from the old EH Green. And so just for a little bit of context for those that may not have realized this is that as part of this project, we're actually reusing our boilers from the old EH Green. Not only was it a cost savings matter, but it was because we have recently purchased those. So they're newer. Um, so what we've done is created a path forward to be able to leverage those in the new space. Um, we're also going to be working um, to get that bus lot ready and paved. We got some of the final um, work done on some of the soil in that back there, um, doing some concrete work in the front. And then another really big kind of milestone for EH Green is at the end of the month, we're going to start moving in some of our kitchen equipment. And that may not sound overly exciting to the average person, um, but that is kind of the momentum that we get as we start to see the furnishings arrive. So um, pretty exciting there. Mr. Lovell. I've seen this picture twice today and I've been trying to figure out what yes. is in the far, I'll say right corner that looks like it's missing a roof. Uh, good what question. Is that? Yeah. And so, if you don't know, it's okay. No, I absolutely like, do know. So that is our mechanical courtyard. Um, and so the reason that we have a space there that has walls, but no roof is because as you can imagine, our mechanical equipment for a building that size is somewhat loud. And so when it was designed, we did that because we know we're close to the property line. So that is a way for us to be able to take care of our neighbors, um, minimize the noise of that equipment that's operating. Um, you can access that kind of from the side, but in that area there, that's our shipping and receiving and all of our other um, areas. So that's a really good question. That's great. Thank you for yep. I, I'm sure our neighbors appreciate that. Absolutely. The other thing I do want to mention on the H Green is that um, even though we get temporary occupancy of our new space on July 1st, obviously we're going to be working towards getting our students in there. But I think it's important that we always point out as well that this is also a renovation. So we're actually going to have workers on that property through November as we renovate the gyms and renovate the um, the current cafeteria that will be music space in addition to demolition of the actual site and the creation of new parking facilities on the property. I also well, want to give quick just question. A, oh, how, how long will the demolition take of the building that's going to be torn down? So we have, um, I'm going to not give you a direct answer, but I'm going to give you an answer. How about that? Um, so our students last day is on June 3rd. We have two days to be able to completely bring all the equipment, get planes moving storage, everything out of that building. Um, Graybot Construction gets a hold of the building on June, or June 6th. That starts kind of the quote unquote demolition period, but that starts with remediation of the building. So as you can imagine, they got to go in, they have to rip out electric, they've got to rip out things before they can actually tear it down. All said and done, the goal is to have that building down by the start of the school year um, so that we can get some of the parking in and then we can start again doing the um, renovation site development. We joke on this on the south part, um, so where Mr. Lewis was mentioning kind of that mechanical yard there, if you notice up against the houses on Hagawa, there's high piles of dirt, they call that Mount Hagawa. That dirt is actually has to be moved across site because that's going to be going into the infill where the building has gone. So there's still a lot of movement that has to happen on that site. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Mr. Lovell, the other thing, if you, mm -hmm. if you don't mind mentioning 
just some of the things they did to cut down on the time that they've already done inside the building. Oh, yeah. So obviously with green, um, it's an aging building. So there's a lot that goes within that. So um, there's asbestos remediation and things. And while there's not a lot in that building, one of the things that we knew we had to do if we wanted to keep on that time frame for demolition during the summer is to do as much remediation that we could when students weren't there during the school year. So that looked like our crews going in over Christmas break, over spring break, um, and on the weekends to be able to get in there, take certain areas, do what they need to do. And what that does is that buys us significant time in the summer and it cuts down on overall cost of the project so that we make sure that we are actually having our students show up on the first day of school in that building. Um, and, I, and again, I will give a shout out to our team at EH Green because um, they, they've been learning in a space that has been an active work site all year, not only with the construction behind them, um, but also there are areas that we've had to take ceiling tiles out in the spring and things like that. So um, it's been challenging, but to Mr. Lewis's point a little bit earlier, we knew that came with kind of the scope of the projects and not creating temporary spaces, but being able to mitigate and manage um, these projects while on site. Okay. Uh, the junior high, just a quick update here. Um, I, these are, by the way, new drone photos, and we post those out online as well, so you can go ahead and take a look at those. We appreciate our partnership with SHP and getting those to us. I think it just gives, it's kind of like the exclamation point on what we talk about. It shows you kind of the scale and scope. Um, what I want to do here is I really just want to focus on the lower half of this picture. That is the theater. Um, and so this is really exciting. So when you see that part right there that looks like the um, the block is kind of coming out of the ground. That is actually right where the bus transportation compound sat. So that gives you a little bit of a kind of aerial 3000 foot view of um, kind of where that lands. Um, the reason I want to point that out though is because that, that feeder gym area is kind of the last portion of the project to get finalized. So they worked obviously similar to green. We started back in the academic areas and we've moved our way to the administration areas and over there to, to the gym, the auxiliary gym and the theater. Um, when you look at that though, I just want you to kind of take a look at the size of that building, the gym and the theater. Now that will be connected by hallways, but just the size of that, comparatively speaking to the other half of the building and how large of that space it is and how much of a benefit that's going to be for our students, but not only our students, our community as we look at that theater um, and the work that's being done there. Um, but anyways, we got some other bullet points there. Again, slabs being pulled, drywalls being installed. In fact, if you look at the academic areas at the junior high, they're only a few months behind the, um, the academic area at EH Green. And that seems a little strange, but the scale of the project, the size of the project is much bigger, but they focused on that academic area um, kind of first. The last thing I want to show you here is an aerial view of our multi-use field over at Sycamore High School. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share this with you because I think that anybody can, can attest to driving down Cornell Road, it just looked like they just kept moving dirt. Every time I went over, I'm like, did they literally just move the pile there to there? Like, what are they actually doing? And so this gives us a really good view. And in the upper kind of left-hand corner of this picture, you see the new access drive going in there. And then you'll see somewhat kind of a pad of gravel. That's actually strategic because that was put in, we actually have contractors that are out on site. So for example, um, our bleacher contractor actually was mobilized this week and they're starting to form the um, form the, where the bleachers are going to be going. And so that's going to be parking for the contractors that are going to be on site. But that actual drive is where the real new kind of access road's going to go. So a couple updates here right now, um, top stool stripping and the cut is complete. Um, they're doing the excavation for the final grade for the field in the bleacher area, and that's really close to being done. Obviously, with the wet weather, it um, created some bit of a delay. Um, the storm and sanitary installations underway. I mentioned the bleacher contractors out. The next big thing, which will be on 613, is moats. Our turf contractors start to go, going to be beginning to mobilize and starting that field install. Um, and then lastly, we've got the installation of the underground conduit for electrical and technology. Um, the reason that we put that bullet point on there is because I think it's really important to mention that it's not just building a field. Um, we have to build the infrastructure for the field, which includes our fiber going out there, electric. And in the midst of that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to equip those spaces um, so that we don't have to go back when we start to build on. If we start talking about um, locker rooms and things like that out there. We want to make sure that we are equipped 
all of our resources are out there so we can tap into it and not have to necessarily go back and rip out something that we put in. So we're trying to be strategic in that manner. Um, but those are kind of the updates I wanted to share with you today. Obviously, there's a lot going on across all of our projects. There's constantly things happening at the high school. Um, I look forward to giving you updates over the summer with the high school because there's going to be a lot of action. Mr. Lovell, you said something that was very intriguing to me about oh, no. the junior high. <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask, right? Go for it. Well, you said that the academic spaces mm -hmm. are just as far along as green. And sure. this past week, Mr. Ballin and I had a tour from Mr. Tudor of EH Green, and it's just amazing to sort of see that building mm -hmm. come to life. There, is there any chance that we could be in the junior high this fall, the new junior high? No, there okay. is uh, absolutely no chance that we'll be in the junior high this fall. All right. You know, I had to ask that question. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yep. I, I think that just like green, I think we have to recognize with the junior high, even though it, it could be ahead of schedule, um, there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done on that site in order to be able to create parking, infrastructure, things like that. Um, but I, I won't stand in front of you and tell you that um, we, we, they are significantly ahead of schedule with the junior high, which is great. Um, but we're also in an environment with supply chain issues. So I always have to have that caveat. Um, that something could go. For example, we do know that they're having a hard time getting electrical switches. And we're not talking like in the classroom, we're talking like the giant switch for electric for the building and things like that. And so it, it's not going to impact the opening of the fall, but it may impact us being able to be in that building, even though it looks or feels complete. I think the other thing that Mr. Lovell and I just spent time on today was that we found out that the, um, the Cooper Road Bridge and another bridge in our community are going to be under construction, significant construction from potentially March of 23 to October of 23, which does, and Mr. Lovell did a great job of advocating for the district, um, just trying to appeal to their sense of, look, if you shut this down, and I'm talking a complete closure of that bridge, and I, I know several of us live that with the Weller Road Bridge, and we asked the guy, is it similar in nature? It is not as significant of a, re a rehab as that project, but it's still, I think we learned it could be anywhere from 30 to 60 days closed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we said, could let's really try to make sure that it's, you know, kind of first in the line and not where it would impact our opening of that school year. Cause we want to have a positive start to that year. I think we can manage, I'll use one of Mr. Lovell's terms. We can manage that tension. I didn't make the movement. We're, we can manage that tension going to the end of the school year, but the last thing we want to do opening a brand new school is to have that tension on top of us trying to open it. So uh, I would say ODOT was receptive. Our community partners, Montgomery and Blue Ash, were extremely helpful. So um, Mr. Lovell is going to follow up and kind of give them some timelines that are important to us, and we're hopeful that we can make the impact that we need to kind of manage that along. So Kudos to Mr. Uh, Lovell for his leadership in that meeting today. Great. Thank you for the update, Five as questions. always. Yep. Um, I need a motion for the approval of change order Sims Elementary School Renovation Project GMP number three. So moved. Second. Any I just... I just want to call this one out. I know this is a rather large number. Um, this is one of those items that after we lived in the space, we realized that there were some HVAC concerns in a part of a new building. And so there were some mitigation efforts that we could have, but we wanted to create a long-term fix for it that would actually um, not require us to be going back in the short term to, big, to do the bigger fix. And so why we had the crew out there, um, we're just moving forward with this. Any other questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Mr. Ballin. Aye. Mr. Comerford. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of change orders for Sycamore Junior High construction project. So moved. Second. Any Anything from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Wines? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the change orders for Sycamore High School Renovation Project GMP number two. So moved. 
back end. I do want to kind of just jump in here and talk about these two. The first one specifically for the occupancy sensors. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do as we work through the budgets of each of these projects and look at the contingencies and look at the money that's spent is any opportunity that we have to be able to come back and to be able to look at long-term energy efficiency. We want to do that. The district has, submit, has committed long-term um, in investing in facilities that we can minimize the energy impact and cost savings to the district. And so as we're doing these renovations, um, we work very closely with our team, specifically David Davis. I just want to give him a shout out um, to have an eye on some of these things and say, hey, what, are, what can we do now in order, again, for that long-term savings? And this is one of those items that made sense um, in the high school, and it is standard across the district. Um, the other one I do want to mention, obviously, this is a rather large number, so I'm sure that you would love some explanation on this one. Um, as we started the high school project from the very beginning, um, just to give you a little historical context, um, at one point we were actually considering um, putting the transportation compound in the back corner, kind of to the west of the Gregory Center in that area. Um, obviously, the journey with the transportation department has been long. Um, and so as we were navigating towards um, getting the GMP set for the first phase of the high school, and just as a reminder, the high school has been kind of phased out in how we've approached that for GMPs. Um, we were not, the district at that time was not ready to commit to where that transportation department would be going, but we didn't want to delay the total scope of the high school project at the same rate. And so what they went ahead and do, or what you went ahead and do, did, is, what, is agreed to the GMP to start the construction. As the phases have continued, we get closer to the conversation of, now that we know the buses have to move from the front new lot entrance, which we've had conversations about um, traffic flow, site circulation, and all of that, we know the buses have to go now to, that new, to a new spot, which was identified over to where we were going to potentially put the transportation compound. The reason that this is a change order is because that number was never identified from the very beginning. And so what we're doing now is we're saying now's the time since we're on the site to go ahead and do this. The significance in this dollar is because if we want to bring buses onto a site, similarly speaking to all of our bus lots, so whether it's here in front of Mapledale or EH Green, the high school current lot, um, it's not just regular asphalt that you would have in a parking lot. Um, there's significant work that goes into that lot to be able to support the weight of the buses over time. Um, and so that's part of this significant cost is that we want to ensure that that lot is set and ready to go. And so that's kind of how that lot and this number has ended up now as we've looked forward through the process and these progress of the of, of the total site. Yeah, I, I mean, I just this number still concerns me. Um, you know, there was always plans to have bus drop off at the high school. So the fact that it, that it wasn't in the original scope, I just feel is a miss from our partners. I understand the need for it and I understand why we have to do this. But you know, now this is the second or third time we've come back with pavement with additional sure. costs to the board, which have been very significant dollars. So um, I understand we moved the transportation department around because we did, mm -hmm. but there was always bus drop off in the original plan at the high school. We never would have had a, a high school or any school plan that there weren't gonna be a bus drop off area for. So um, that's just my my comments on it. Yeah, I, Appreciate I, that. I agree, Mr. Ballant. Can you tell me how this affects the contingency? Yeah, so I, I could actually, Beth, do you feel comfortable enough kind of talking through how we've looked at these numbers and how they play with the total budget? Because we do have funds within that we can cover this. Um, but I'll let Ms. Weber kind of Sure. Um, we have about a half a million dollars included in uh, as part of the allocated budget for site circulation and roadway. We think that most of the cost of this parking lot will be able to be um, paid for out of that once we have the, the turn lane um, into the high school as well. So anything that would not be covered by that would be come out of the contingency budget. We don't have an exact um, amount of how that's going to be allocated at this point, but we will provide you an update when we know. And I, and I do, um, I hear your concerns, um, and I, I'm not here to, to say that um, the cost isn't more now than it would have been if we did that at the beginning of the project. I think we all recognize the situation we're in right now with the cost of oil and prices and things like that. Um, so I do recognize your comments. 
Mr. Lovell, did, I believe last time we talked, Mr. Hyden was involved in reviewing some of this to make sure that it was not included in the scope, just to kind of verify and yes, double sir. check. Yes, sir. What yep. Mr. Fallon was concerned about. Mm -hmm. Um, and just another question. I'm assuming we're not going to have another um, change order for some kind of design element of the bus drop off or something like that. Like this, correct? Like we're not going to have SHP come back to us with a redesign of something that's going to cost us additional dollars, correct? As it relates to parking, no, yes. that was all okay. done in that site circulation package within included or now includes this bus. Okay. Um, Kleinger's, our civil engineers have already submitted those plans. Okay, and thank you. Mrs. Bitter, Dr. Steger, I just want to clarify who I was talking about. Mr. Hyden is our legal counsel from Bricker that works on the construction side of uh, our work, I realize you have, I don't think you've met Mr. Hyden, but uh, he's heavily involved with Mr. Lovell. I used to work with him in obviously in the prior role, but um, he advises us on anything construction and kind of manages a lot of the contracts, the amendments with our architects and uh, our contractors. So kind of keeps us in that safe place from a legal standpoint. So we felt it was important to go back and look at the scope of work to make sure that some of these things that we've been asked to fund were not included in any prior scope. So, any additional questions? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. And Mr. Ballant? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the change order Sycamore High School Exterior Athletics Early Site Package GMP 3A and Campus Parking Early Site Package 3B. So moved. Second. I don't have any comments unless you have questions. Any questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the agreement with Klein Energies Group District Paving Projects. So moved. Second. Okay, just to give you an overview of this, so Klanger's is the company that we've historically used to um, complete our paving projects, whether that be anything from our tennis courts to our parking lots to our playgrounds, whatever it may be. Um, this year, we've taken a year off, um, which was a really good decision uh, of any paving projects in the, dis in the district. Uh, it's a good decision for many reasons. Um, but what we recognize is that we need to go back and we need to create a new five-year plan that incorporates our new spaces and our new buildings. Um, and so this fee is to help us build out that five-year plan that's going to help us influence our capital improvement um, projects and our budget that we'll be back to bring to you. It's very similar to how we leverage Garland for our roofing projects. Good plan. Thank you. Any questions? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of service agreement infrastructure in structure incorporator. So moved. Second. Mr. Ballant, as you can see, Mr. Fritz is uh, coming to the microphone and um, I just want to say and appreciate uh, Mr. Fritz's leadership on this item. He spent a good deal of time over the last year uh, working collaboratively with staff and uh, forming a committee uh, to work on this item. So I will turn it over to Mr. Fritz to kind of give you that overview. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Good evening. Uh, so we have a history of having a learning management system here at Sycamore back in 2002 started with Blackboard and it's been with us now for 18 years. And over the course of those years, we've seen a lot of changes in that uh, uh, software industry in that space. Uh, you've seen also Google come into that space in the last 10 years, roughly. Uh, what you've seen then is a lot of um, innovation in the way now you interact with students in a different way. Uh, obviously in the last two years, online learning and, and learning management systems have really flourished. And people have said, yeah, we need an infrastructure. Uh, we were gonna do this two years ago. Uh, and, and I see Mrs. Wagner shaking her head. That's what we were gonna do. We we're gonna do a committee together, look at 
picking one learning management system, revisiting where we are today at that point, which was Blackboard learning management system, which if you remember, a lot of the colleges had Blackboard as well. So we went through a, a series since October, quite frankly, uh, interviewing staff, surveying staff, having, having 33 diverse staff members on our team from K through 12 grades, as well as special area folks, and asking ourselves, we wanna to get to a place where Currently today, we have Schoology, uh, Google Classroom, which some people call an LMS, but it really isn't a learning management system, and uh, Blackboard fragmentation, trying to now bring it to one place where we could get perhaps a solution that would manage or be available for all of our K-12 and meet their needs. Uh, went through this, uh, did a lot of deeper dive demos. Actually, Mrs. Weber was on the uh, part of the team as well. Uh, I know, uh, uh, Becky was also on the team. Uh, so what we did is okay, got it down to three, Schoology uh, and also uh, Canvas, which is in structure, which we're presenting this evening, uh, as well as another item or another LMS called Brightspace out of Canada. Uh, went through all that, actually had 19 teachers pilot it in the spring. Uh, so we had a lot of engagement, a lot of learning. I will tell you some of the big items that people really focused on, and I have them in my notes here. Uh, but it was really around Google integration. We're using these Google Workspace tools. We really want it to integrate well for us. Uh, how does it look for age appropriateness? On the K through four space, as you know, some of these learning management systems look more secondary higher ed-ish, if I could say that. Uh, we really came down to looking at and seeing those pieces. Another one is integration with our student information system and uh, grade book integration that I can move grades back and forth. So we looked at it from a lens uh, from how do I support this on the back end and a lens from our teachers from what's good teaching and learning practices and what this software looks like. So I'm giving you a lot on this because I think we spent since October. So I wanted to just not say here it is, uh, but I want to at least give you the big 30,000 foot picture and the work we did together. Um, and at the end of the day, Canvas, which is really in structure, also is a nice tool because we're using another one of their tools called Mastery Connect, uh, which is... Uh, and Mrs. Wagner could probably do it better justice than I can, but our teachers use that tool and there's some integration as well there uh, for sh our short cycle assessments and, and things of such nature. Uh, so now the big heavy work after you approve this night is really about implementation. What does it look like going forward? So I'll give you a vision. Next year, we're not saying teachers need to move off of where you are today. We're giving you the opportunity for a year to make that transition. We're gonna provide training, we're gonna provide support. But when we get to July 1 of next year, 2023, you'll see me smiling, uh, as you know. Uh, but also, we will also have, they'll be asked to move on from wherever they are today. Um, and we'll move into this fully embraced uh, as, as well. So given our teachers a year, convert their data, walk alongside them, uh, we're going to have some of our teachers that were here tonight actually uh, supporting our, our retirees. They're going to be some of our trainers in this. So good work uh, on all of that, on all the folks together. I just want to publicly thank uh, Mr. Fritz for just the process that he put together. Highly collaborative, teacher voice, administrator voice, um, K through 12 representation. Um, it was really just a very robust, focused process that took in feedback from multiple folks. He even held focus groups, folks that were not involved in the actual team. He made sure any meetings were recorded. So if folks wanted to have information, even though they may not have been on the, the pilot team, they could certainly get it. Um, and so I just wanna publicly thank, thank you, Mr. Fritz for your process. Very, very well done, thank you. Can you talk, Mr. Fritz, about, so this is replacing Blackboard. Yes, and in, in, in July of 2023, we're going to right. give people the opportunity to transition. That's correct. So mm -hmm. is, is Canvas a product of Mastery Connect? So Instructure is the parent company who actually uh, manages both Mastery Connect and Canvas. They are two separate products. If we want them to integrate, there is a nice integration there. So, and we are looking at, I, and I don't want to speak for Mrs. Wagner, but we're looking at different grade levels are going to use um mastery connect and that'll that that's kind of working through so if we want some of that integration to happen we can this was the decision was not made upon mastery connect let me just be very okay, clear well, that was just a byproduct that if it, if we'd like to we can integrate that but 
uh, in structures been the original manufacturer and developer of Canvas. They purchased Mastery Connect to add on an additional feature if people would like to use that. Mr. Fritz, thank you for anticipating my question. Yes. Um, but I, and I think at a future meeting, I would like to hear from our curriculum team about Mastery Connect a little bit more and how we're utilizing it. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Mr. Fritz. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Ballant. Aye. Mr. Comerford. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of administrative contracts renewal. So moved. Second. Mr. Lewis, any? No comments other than, you know, obviously we, we worked through the evaluation process and uh, obviously it's time for contract renewals uh, per the guidelines of state law. So uh, we're bringing these contracts forward. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. Mr. Comerford. Aye. And Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the classified director contract renewal. So moved. Second. We're excited to have Mr. Miller continue in that role and help us with our transportation. Uh, as we know, the next couple of years are going to be very challenging with uh, transportation. We're excited as well. <clears throat> Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Mr. Comerford. Aye. And Mr. Ballant. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of class of 2022, and I will ask that the parent of uh, a proud graduate make that motion. So moved. <laughs> Second. So this is our annual approval that we asked for from the board. Uh, the list that's included uh, in the packet are obviously students that have uh, the high school is certifying has completed their requirements of graduation. So we're asking for your approval uh, so that we can go next Sunday and recognize these great graduates. So um, I know that we have several up here sitting with us that are going to be uh, emotional, excited, uh, and proud. And proud. Very proud. So save it. I save it for later. It's going to be exciting. And uh, it's, it's, again, as I said at the beginning, the retirees is a great day of the year, but graduation is that culmination. And um, just seeing all of our graduates and seeing uh, the excitement and the pride of Sycamore on that day is, is huge. So I do believe we have one of the best graduation ceremonies around. Mr. Lewis, do you have the number of graduates that we have off the top of your head? I do not have all, that off the top of my I head. Was, I think it's right Thank around five, 430, I think. 430? I was just yeah. curious. I, my guess would have been 440, but that's it. So I was close. Yeah, it's a little bit smaller class. Great, thanks. <laughs> Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the resolution approving easement for Duke Energy Sycamore Junior High Project. I don't know. So I moved. Second. Mr. Lewis, any comments? No comments. Any questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. Mr. Lewis, moving on to other. Just, just a couple of quick things. The, obviously, we just talked about graduation, which is, you know, uh, exciting. And CentOS Center um, next Sunday will be great. Uh, the other things that are going on is, you know, we have all of our, uh, a lot of our athletic teams are finishing up their spring seasons. Uh, we had four GMC champions uh, out of eight sports. So that's pretty impressive. I mean, uh, just they're having a lot of success. So um, was girls lacrosse, let's see if I can get it right, boys track, boys volleyball, and one that I'm missing. Tennis. Tennis. Yeah, how can I forget this top-ranked state tennis team? But <laughs> <clears throat> So uh, obviously that's going very well. And then also our music programs. I, I can honestly say this has been – we keep saying hashtag May in the office because it's just been incredible the amount of stuff that is going on right now. So um, just about every night there's a music event or a graduation or 
something going on. So uh, if you have no shortage of uh, opportunities to catch our students performing or doing uh, great things. Uh, we had our first art, fine arts signing a couple of Fridays ago, which was uh, impressive 19 students going on to uh, do fine arts in college. Um, and then this Saturday, we have Forever Green uh, at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, recognizing the history of E.H. Green. It is a self-guided tour if you're interested. Uh, it'll be a great event. Uh, we also have a, the luncheon for the distinguished alumni, Jerome Bird, um, at, at uh, Montgomery Inn. I believe it's starting at 1130. Um, so again, just lots of activities. And then the last thing I'll mention is our junior high choir um, was just selected to perform uh, in New York. So I know they're very excited. Uh, they put that out for immediate release and that is exciting for our students to have those opportunities. Mr. Lewis, you have to say it's at Carnegie Hall. That's a huge accomplishment. It, it is at Carnegie Hall. Thank you. Thank you very much. But exciting times for our, our students and all the opportunities that they have. And I think it highlights the exceptional um, opportunities outside the classroom that our students have. I also would like to add on to the um, choir concert last night. I went to the 815 show. I thought they did a great job blending the high school and the junior high last night in their choir concert. So congratulations to Mr. Callahan and Mrs. Stein. Anything else, Mr. Lewis? I need a motion for the approval of the treasurer's consent agenda. So moved. Second. Could I, could I take a moment backwards and just highlight one other thing? I thought the after prom that was last Saturday night was an excellent um, effort by a lot of parent volunteers, but it was also really well, um, the behavior of the students was exceptional. I just thought it was really one of those marquee nights for the district and the volunteers that put in so much work over the course of months and then the night itself went off really well. I just maybe wanted to comment on that. Mr. Comerford, I appreciate you bringing that up. I think I'm still sleep deprived from the after prom, but um, I would say the prom and the after prom, uh, the B Mr. Mater sent something out to all the staff, to the, to the high school parents, you know, complimenting the students. And I witnessed it firsthand. They were well behaved. They just enjoyed the evening. I think it was just exciting for them to be together and in, I've been to a lot of after proms in my time of being a, a high school administrator. I will tell you, I've never seen anything like that. Um, the Sycamore after prom was a whole next level of after prom. So I'm not sure what other districts have, but it was incredible. I mean, the food people were bringing around sushi. I mean, who has that at after prom? So uh, phenomenal job by all the the volunteers and huge thank you to anybody that stayed after 2:30 to clean that whole thing up because I was dead by 2.30. I couldn't, I couldn't do any more, but good job by all. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Dippold. I think you probably pay a lot of the bills for that still as treasurer of the PTO. So thank you so much. Okay, well, but you know, you know what it costs. <laughs> okay, so we're on to the treasurer's consent agenda. Okay, I, I want to point out just two items on, on the treasurer's consent agenda this evening that um, just to give you a little bit of the rest of the story, you do see that there's an increase in the child nutrition budget that's to cover additional food costs because as we've all seen when we go to Kroger or other grocery stores that um, food costs have increased significantly. Um, so that has impacted the budget for our child nutrition program. Um, I, I will add, though, that as we noted in last um, month's uh, board meeting, that we have received significant additional dollars from um, the feds to cover our costs in that program, um, including a grant that um, Mrs. Warren recently submitted for that helped to cover the additional costs, of, I believe, um, milk primarily for the program. Um, where we're going to receive just about $100,000. It's actually already in the bank. So uh, very quick turnaround from uh, the feds and, and providing an additional allocation to us to help deal with some of these escalating costs of food. 
Um, so thank you to Mrs. Warren for again, seeking out those opportunities and um, helping with the operations of, of her department. The second thing is under the state grant area, um, uh, we have added about $30,000 to the budget for a safety grant um, from the Attorney General's office. That is at, due to the efforts of Mr. Foster and Mrs. Elvey, um, who applied for that grant and um, provide, and I don't know a lot about it, but that's something Mr. Lewis, maybe we would like to make the board aware of, of some of the things that will be able to be accomplished with that grant. So again, just going after those opportunities when they arise and um, bringing those dollars into the district. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. And Mr. Comerford. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of financial reports, April, 2022. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, I'm not, I don't know that I have a lot of updates on the financial reports themselves. I do wanna just note that the um, first page of the financial report, we always look at the five-year forecast um, and how we are comparing to the forecast. Uh, the report that you have this evening compares um, our results through April 30th through the forecast that was um, presented back in November. So when you see this same report next month, um, you'll notice that the dollars uh, align much more closely because we've been able to provide some, some updated information and, and look at the trends and some impacts on some areas of the five-year forecast. Um, so I guess with that, does anyone have any questions about the April financial report? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. And Dr. Steger? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the five-year forecast. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, just an update, a few um, pieces of information about the five-year forecast. Uh, this is a, a report that the board is required by Ohio Revised Code um, and overseen by the Ohio Department of Education to provide um, a five-year plan uh, for the general operating fund, which is the, the major fund for which we receive real estate taxes. Um, it provides three years of historical information as well as uh, five years of projected information. So starting with the 21-22 the school year through the 25-26 school year. Um, the, while this is required by the state of Ohio, it's also been a um, document that the board has used um, significantly in its planning um, in keeping us on track to meet different financial goals, um, to make sure that we look at the impact of the large decisions of the board and um, to be able to communicate with our community um, about when we might see financial challenges or even good news about how we're um, uh, operating as a school district. So um, again, while it's an ODE requirement, the Ohio Department of Education monitors this. We provide, we um, present it and, and submit it to ODE twice a year. Um, it really is also an important tool for our Board of Education um, as, we, as we look at our financial plan for our district. Um, so again, this was approved back in November. And so tonight, I just wanna give you some updates in both um, any changes that you would have seen primarily um, in the part, partially in the current year, but also um, in the out years of the forecast, knowing that this year is, is probably is much more um, accurate as you get further and further out into time. This is truly just a forecast, but it is what we utilize to try to um, see where we might have any kind of financial issues and can head them off or um, make sure that if there's anything that we think we might be able to uh, communicate with our, our legislature, we have, we can share with them the impact 
ongoing. So I want to give some, a few updates on the, the uh, both the revenue projections and expenditures, things that have changed since we last looked at the forecast in February. So first is um, property tax collection. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that because we we've, we've discussed that at, at prior board meetings, where um, notified you that our property taxes actually came in a bit under projection for uh, the current uh, school year. Um, we have adjusted that somewhat downward in the out years of the forecast. Um, that is basically some of the impact of um, reevaluation of um, and some board of revision work for our business properties. Um, we, we really do take a pretty conservative approach to those and we'll continue to monitor that. Um, you know, for example, we know that um, we have the, the natural gas pipeline coming in that will impact our, our tangible personal property tax for utilities. Um, we just aren't quite sure when that's going to hit uh, the forecast because it takes some time until it's complete, until the natural gas is flowing through it, until um, it actually hits the book, and then there's a delay um, in when those collections actually occur. So. It's likely that we'll see an impact of this sometime in the term of this contract or term of this forecast. I'm just not exactly sure when it will be. Um, we also have some, some new construction coming on, on the books. Um, but, but again, with most of the, what's going on in the district is um, in terms of corporate um, improvements are actually going to be seen in our all other revenue line, which is um, tax and corrupt financing agreements. So that's just an update on property tax collection. Again, I think we, we've been really fortunate um, in that when you think of back two years ago, what we thought might happen with our, our property values, uh, for, the, for the most part, they have stayed very stable. And we've actually been able to benefit from some growth um, in our community, which is, which is pretty exciting considering we're kind of self-contained um, within within 275 and, and being able to um, continue to see some uh, rejuvenation and growth in our community. Uh, the next area that I want to talk about is, is state funding. And one of the things that I've continued to comment as we've had our monthly financial reports is that um, it looks like our state funding is coming in higher than what we had initially anticipated from the projections from the state last year. Um, and that um, continues to, to be, um, be seen. And we're actually upward revising the future years of the forecast up a bit from where we had initially uh, planned in, in uh, that line of our funding. Um, I will just give a little bit of caution while we have some growth shown in uh, 2024 through 26. Uh, when the state passed the new budget, they only approved it um, through uh, the new funding model through 23. Um, so it could go back to the old model, but I'm being optimistic that it will stay in place for future years and have, have some minimal growth. Um, you know, we're still not seeing uh, state funding where I think it should be because we still receive less per pupil than um, our private schools in the area do um, for, for the education of our students. Um, I'm not saying that in any way or shape or form to, that I think they should receive less. I think we should receive as much as they do. So we'll continue to work toward that. But it is um, edging upward a little bit. One of the other areas in, in the state funding line that um, we are seeing some growth is in the restricted federal grants and aid um, area. And that's based on two things. One of the things is that um, there are several areas of the, of the foundation formula that instead of just being kind of, these are unrestricted monies, now they have been deemed rest restricted funds in that um, the state will require us to report back that they were used for certain things. One is the, the health and wellness monies that the uh, uh, Governor DeWine approved a couple of years ago. There's some additional um, reporting requirements, um, funds for gifted, which um, we you know have received in the past, but it's now shifted into 
the restricted category. Um, we've always spent well more than what we've gotten in gifted funds, so it's not going to be any kind of issue with um, being able to report that. It's just that the way, it's the way that the state is reflecting it differently within the forecast. And probably the, the biggest thing that is actually bringing more money into the district is the state um, basically doubled the allocation they had in their budget to assist school districts with um, the educational costs of our students with disabilities. And these are the ones who have the most critical needs and the most um, costly um, uh, programming to be able to to meet their needs and to be able to educate our students in our schools. So the state is actually um, providing additional funding to help us with that. So I think that's a great move on the state's part. Um, and it's a, a process that we see going from bringing us about $300,000 a year. This year we're projecting about half a million dollars, but we anticipate that that may as much as double in future years. Um, just because of the, the way the state's funding it. So that's um, what we see as good news. And finally, in revenue, um, just the other local fund, we're uh, continuing to see um, increases in our tax increment financing funding. Um, of that 7.9 million that we received this year, um, nearly 6 million of that is from our tax increment financing um, allocation with our, with, uh, agreements with in Blue Ash Montgomery um, and Sycamore Township, and we will see that continue to grow. Um, we're also seeing um, a change in how the state was working with tuition payments, and those are primarily um, dollars that were going out of the district for um, tuition to cover John Peterson scholarships and autism. Those are now being paid directly, so that actually helps us with, in that category as well. So lots of changes in the revenue areas and those that we have have continued to um, drive, carry across the, the five years of the forecast. We're actually seeing our revenue um, have, has increased a bit over where we thought it would be in November, which is good news. Um, on the expenditure side, the, uh, there are a couple of things that we have changed since November. One is, um, while we knew that we were going to have a 9% increase in health insurance um, effective 2022 um, in our discussions with the Butler Health Plan because of many of the things going on in the healthcare community, large claimants within our plan, um, they are projecting probably a, another nearly 9% increase in 2023. Um, you know, that's after many, many, many years of some years no increase, 2%. You know, I think on average our increase over the last five years was about 2% per year, which is unheard of um, in, in the health insurance market. But um, so many things are changing in the health, health insurance um, uh, areas in general that we're starting to see those changes impact us as well. Um, the other area that has been updated significantly since uh, November, and it's actually as a result of some of the discussion we had at our March morning meeting where we looked at our capital improvement allocations, those are now included in, um, in the other um, transfers out area. We're going to um, those reflect those, um, that planning that we um, presented to you in March. So some additional dollars in those areas, primarily for um, roof replacement was a big thing um, and some reallocation of bond dollars back into, into the capital improvement budget. So overall, I think what, what uh, we look at um, in terms of those two areas is how is our um, operating, how are operating costs comparing to our, our operating revenue? Um, in, in this current year, we are still at a point where while we have a, a slight drawdown, it projected um, in our cash balance, um, our operating revenue is still exceeding our operating expenses for this year. Um, what is being, what is occurring that's um, 
making us reduce our cash balance a little bit this year is just that we're started we're utilizing our cash reserves for those capital capital projects. Um, that is also um, continuing in the fiscal year 2023. So starting in 2024 is uh, when you start to see actual operating costs um, exceeding operating revenue. Um, and so think about that. That's been since 2016 um, that when we passed our last levy, um, that, that that has actually occurred. And a lot of that is, you know, some, some um, revenue enhancements either through the state and by the growth and vitality of, of our community. Um, and then being able to have, um, to control our costs as well. So um, I don't know yet, you know, you always say, when do you think our next levy will be? And I, I've said not earlier than, 2023, I'm not quite ready to say 2024, but we are continuing to work really hard um, to make that happen. And we'll be doing a, a significant amount of work um, as, a, as a flight team next year to, to have that occur. Um, cash balance in terms of how that, um, it, we are starting to see that draw down um, over the term of the forecast. A lot of that is due to utilizing that cash reserve for capital improvements. Um, some of it does start to, to be because of our operating costs. Um, but still, even at the end of this term of this budget, we're still um, beyond, above the 25% cap um, that, we, that we want to have in place in terms of cash reserve in comparison to our, uh, in comparison to our costs. So um, hopefully that provides you just a, an overview of where we are, um, we'll be working and bringing to you uh, next month um, our budget for the 22-23 school year. So you'll get a bit more detail on how we're going to be allocating um, the the plan of the in the five-year forecast um, coming real soon. Um, we will provide we will post the five-year forecast as we have um, in all past years out on our website once it's approved. We even archive some of our past copies so that um, our community can can review those if they want. It's when it's submitted to the Ohio Department of Education, they also post it on the, their website. So if anyone would be interested in, in finding it there, so it's with an outside group as opposed to on our on our website. So um, I guess with that, are there any questions? I have two questions, Mrs. Weber. Thank you for a thorough update and thank you for the materials in the packet. I appreciated that. Um, my first question is, was the OPC contract that we are going to vote on later in this meeting, was that, can you clarify, was that blended into the five-year forecast already? Yes, Mr. Comerford, that is included in the five-year forecast. Thank you. And then um, my second question is related to the, the timetable for the operating levy. I, you already answered the question you knew I would ask, but my, when my question is if we, if we are on a 2023 timeline, which we haven't taken off the table yet, what are the deadlines by which we need to make the decision and execute that? When, when is the point when we need to make the decision? Is it 2023 or 2024? Um, I would say that's a decision we'll probably need to make in the fall of 2022 because it takes a, a good six months um, to really get the planning in place for that. And I, but I think by November of, of 2022, we'll have a pretty good idea about whether we'll be able to um, push that off a year. So I'm not too concerned about that. Um, as far as one of, one of the first decisions that will also be key to that would be when you would put the levy on the ballot. Um, and you, I think with, a, with 23, it would be probably a May and November would be your opportunity. So you would have to take action as a board. If you want to be on in May, you'd have to take action probably in January or February of, of next year. So, um, I don't know. Mr. Lewis and I, we're going to work really hard to keep it off the ballot in 2023 because I've told you I don't want to run another levy. 
um, and I am going to be done July of, of 2023, I think. Um, and even though I wouldn't be here in November, I know what kind of planning goes into that. And I'd rather be planning to um, make sure that our community has more time to think about that and that we've done, done what we can to make sure that um, we've contained our costs. So that's not something you have to do sooner rather than later. So just to summarize, as long as we make a decision by November of this year, we should be okay to be on, we could have choices to be on the May, could or, have choices. Yes. May or November ballot. Mm -hmm. okay. So you. I apologize for giving too much information about my personal planning. Yeah, I just really had a comment. Um, the new tool that we're using to actually see the report in this format, I, I think is a big positive change from the way we've seen it before. And it just provides tremendous amount of information to us. So thank you to you and your staff who have implemented this, I don't know, over the last year and a half or so, but um, it's, it's really helpful to me. Okay, you're welcome. Any additional questions? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comifer? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. And Mr. Ballant? Aye, motion passes. I need a motion for the personnel consent agenda, which includes addendum 3D. I moved. Second. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comifer? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. Moving on to other Board of Education business. Uh, item number one, I did a motion for the mem memorandum of understanding with the Ohio Association of Public School Employees, number 243. I moved. Second. Any comments, Mr. Lewis? I was looking at Mrs. Weber just because <clears throat> a huge credit to Mrs. Weber, uh, Mr. Lampy, our legal counsel, Dr. Davis, Mr. Lovell. Uh, they, they spent a significant amount of time working through this. And, um, you know, a huge thank you to OPC 243 and their membership and their leadership because I think, Mrs. Weber, it might have been a record time completion. So uh, I don't know that we've ever finished in one day. Well, I, and I do, I want to thank them as well. Um, and then also the members of, of um, our team. Um, we approached this um, contract expiration with a bit of a different approach because with all the instability right now going on in the labor market and the economy, we determined that we might be, it might be best for us just to look at a one year extension of our current agreement, um, uh, including some salary um, um, updates, um, increases for our group to try to make sure that we really focused on attracting and maintaining staff. Um, but we also not knowing what the next couple of years, whether the, what's going on right now with inflation and that is going to be continuing, we felt it best just to look at a one year agreement um, and also just continue much of basically all of our language um, that deals with working conditions for one year. Um, our goal is to, to get back together with our OPC group that, um, and they actually, just for those of you who are listening and wonder what that group is, it's our bus drivers, our custodial and maintenance group, our child nutrition employees, um, our clerical staff, um, and our educational assistants. Um, so we're going to reconvene with them a year from now, um, utilizing um, an interest-based bargaining model to revisit the entire contract, at least that's our plan at this point in time, where we feel like we have a better idea of how the economy is going to move forward to determine how to continue to, to, to achieve those goals, which is to attract good quality staff who are really um, part of the backbone of what makes this place work. So um, getting ready for that a year from now, but until then, um, we want to thank Thank that group for working with us to get it, keep our labor stability for um, the 22-23 school year with this group. And thank you. Thank them for all the work that they do to keep to keep our district where it is. Any questions or comments? 
Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. And uh, moving on to legislative liaison report. Thank you, Mr. Ballant. Um, okay, the Ohio Supreme Court ordered the Ohio Redistricting uh, Commission to redraw the congressional maps by May 6th. And on May 5th, the commission voted four to three to resubmit legislative maps that it had previously submitted to the court on February 24th. So stay tuned for that. Um, State Board of Education selected Stephen Dakin by a 14-4 vote to serve as the superintendent of public instruction. He was previously the vice president of the State Board of Education, and he also worked for the Columbus State Community College overseeing school and community partnerships. Um, House Bill 126 was um, the process for local governments to contest property value through the existing Board of Revision system. The bill was enacted on 421 of this year. Moving on to House uh, Primary and Secondary Education Committee, House Bill 583, just to uh, refresh your memory, this would, uh, requires the State Board of Education to issue a temporary short-term substitute teaching license to approved applicants. Um, it passed the House and is now referred to the Senate Committee. House Bill 497, uh, committee held the third hearing on House Bill 497, which would modify the Eng English language arts assessment to be administered once in the third grade and to eliminate retention under the third grade reading guarantee. House Bill 616, this is Ohio's version of Florida's parental rights and education bill, or as it is also known as don't say gay bill. This bill would task the Ohio Board of Education to determine and define what is divisive or racist. Such things as critical race theory, intersectionality theory, the 1619 project, diversity, equity, and inclusion learning outcomes, and inherited racial guilt would be prohibited. The bill would also ban any materials related to sexual orientation and gender identity for grades K through three in all public and private schools. This bill is currently in committee. The Ohio Education Association has called this bill reprehensible on every level and believes that House Bill 616 would have a chilling effect on student learning and Ohio's education profession, which is currently facing a recruitment crisis. Uh, let me see, I think that's all I have. That's it for legislative liaison. Ooh, sorry about that. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. Um, Dr. Steger's student achievement liaison update. Anything from Mrs. Weiss? I have, Mrs. Yeah, Weiss I have. has that? Okay, thank you. Mrs. Weiss? Okay, thanks. Um, first, to all high school students who took advanced placement courses, congratulations on challenging yourself, working hard, and completing your exams. And thank you to Ms. Um, Sanders at the high school, who really had a great coordination system for that for both parents and students. So thank you to her for that. Um, I had the opportunity last Friday evening, along with Mrs. Bitter, and I think Mr. Comerford, you were there, um, to attend Coral Explosion at the high school. Oh yeah, Mrs. Wagner, you were there too. Um, this fun event showcased um, choral groups from EH Green, the junior high and the high school. And as a district, I think we should be really proud. Dr. Mrs. Davis. Dr. Davis, excuse me. We were all rocking it that night. Um, we should all be really proud of how the arts are available to students of all ages and abilities in our district. It was really a great show. And thank you um, to Mr. Holt who invited us and um, all the other teachers who um, participated. And as we come to the end of the school year and the last student achievement report for this academic year, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our teachers, administrators, educational assistants, and staff for an amazing year for Sycamore students. I think one of the things that Sycamore does best is instill a love of learning in all of our students. Uh, we are creating lifelong learners who embrace the unknown and have the confidence to know that they can learn anything that they set their mind to. What a wonderful attribute to carry into adulthood. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. Um... Mrs. Bitter and Mrs. Weber, policy project update. I'll just, you. I was just going to note that the board uh, did meet on May 3rd to uh, review several policies um, to provide additional input um, into the policy um, manual process. 
We are going to get a draft of the entire manual to provide to the board probably early next week. Um, and we'll start having a review of policy at our June 1st board meeting with the hope that we'll be able to adopt the um, revisions to the policy by, um, I, would, I would guess sometime in July. So gonna be a lot of exciting reading coming your way um, in the next month or so as we um, update the entire policy manual. So thank you to everyone on the flight team who has provided um, input and Mrs. Bitter for attending several meetings and learning a whole lot about policy, I'm sure. Um, and Kenna Haycox, who is the consultant we're working with the Ohio School Board Association. So we're getting close to the next, the next milestone in that process. Mrs. Weber, you don't foresee any additional special board meetings? All that will be done in regular board meetings? I, it, it, we're plan is to do it all in, in regular board meetings. So we'll go through the first review and we will see how it goes. Thank you. But let's much. let's let's really be committed to doing it within special board meetings or within yeah, regular board meetings. I think we can. Yeah. Great. Um, Dr. Steegers and Mr. Comerford, SAC Commission. So first of all, Mr. Comerford had his last SAC meeting and everyone's very happy he was part of the um, commission for the past year and a half. So congratulations, Mr. Comerford, you've done a great job and thank you for guiding me through the process of becoming the board member on that committee. So thank you. Um, do you wanna, I can give the summary, but do you have anything to say about that? Okay, so quickly, um, a quick summary. The um, committee that we, or the subcommittee that we listened to was um, helping us understand better district communication to um, families within uh, the district. So great job to communication because 76% um, <clears throat> of people felt well informed um, but on the teacher level, so great job on the district um, level. The building level, everyone felt 87% of people felt well informed. And at the district level, 90% of the people felt well informed. So, congratulations um, to everyone for being able to provide information to all of us. Um, the one, the one thing that stuck out to me was just having older kids and younger kids is that people are very happy in elementary school with a teacher communication home, but as they're growing up, I don't think parents are really ready to let go of their kids in that daily communication from teachers. So the junior high, they wanted more communication from teachers. Um, so the frequency, 25% of the comments focused on these, um, some of them felt that if they had multiple kids in multiple buildings, they were more overwhelmed with building information two times. If it was a district information, it was four times um, more overwhelmed. So we have an opportunity for growth as a district there um, to make sure that parents aren't feeling overwhelmed with information. And then this parents really liked um, the SMORE, the parent portal and notifications, final form notifications and direct emails. <clears throat> Sorry, I apologize, I'm losing my voice. Uh, so their their idea is to come up with an extra layer of communication to try to fine tune this process called the communication activators. Um, so whether it's about buses, sports, buildings, et cetera, they want to have an opportunity for reach out meetings in neutral locations um, to try to help the community members understand what's going on in our schools. So it's not just school based, it's also going to be reaching out to the community. So that was their big idea. Mr. Comerford. I just, uh, I have appreciated working with the Sycamore Advisory Commission for two and a half years. They've been a great group. This year's presentations, all four were excellent. And um, I uh, appreciate that and know they're in good hands with you, Dr. Steger. Mr. Ballin, if I could, I just want to say thank you to Mr. Comerford for his leadership on that committee and dedication to the, to the work and the projects and you know, uh, I agree with Mr. Comerford, those, the projects this year were all action oriented. They, and I will tell you from the team, uh, the, from the flight team, the members that contributed to the projects, they said they felt uh, the projects were better than they've ever been. And I, I would agree with that. I really appreciated the work of the team. They always do great research, but they not only did great research, but they gave us action oriented items to act on. Um, and that's the difference. So Mr. Comerford, we appreciate your work. Dr. Steger, I'm looking forward to working with you on that committee and 
uh, continuing the work with that great team that you can see um, there is still great interest in being a part of that team by numerous community members, as you'll see uh, forward on the agenda. One more quick thing. Congratulations to the seniors who are graduating out of that committee also. And then uh, Mr. Lewis, are the new students, you want to name them right now or? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we have two new students that are joining us. Uh, they're both juniors at the high school, so they'll be around for a couple of years. Uh, Elijah Hill uh, and Tanvi Maya. So we're looking forward to working with them on our team. They're both excited. I thought I would have to like kind of twist some arms to come to a Monday night meeting, but they were like, no, I'll sign up. I'm ready. I mean, like immediately when I asked them. So I was like, well, this, that was easy. I thought this was going to be a lot harder. So excited to work with them. And Dr. Steger's right. The students bring so much to that team. Um, Lauren Barnes and Nick Coley, um, they're going to be leaving us, but they're excited seniors ready to go off and tackle the next uh, thing in their lives. Great. Thank you very much. I need a motion for the approval of Sycamore Advisory Commission officers. So moved. Second. Whoever, please call the roll. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mr. Comerford. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. And Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of Sycamore Advisory Commission members at large and representatives. So moved. Second. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comerford. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballot. Aye. And Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion to go into executive session for RC 121.22G1, employment and discipline of a public employee, official, or regulated individual. So moved. Second. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Comerford. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. And Dr. Steger. Aye. Motion passes. We will not be taking any votes and we will adjourn the meeting at the end of executive session.